This, this is the ABQ Business Podcast with your host, Jason Rigby. Each week, we'll interview visionary business leaders to inspire the creative power and spirit that's in every entrepreneur. Discussing strengths, weaknesses, strategies, systems, and the problems we can all solve together for a new future for local small business. Hello, everyone. This is Jason Rigby with the Albuquerque Business Podcast. I've got a really cool guest today. I'm super excited. We have been talking back and forth on LinkedIn, Travis, what, about uh, three or four months now? Yeah. And Travis is a TEDx speaker. He also has a unique ability to be able to communicate. Um, And I want you to kind of, if you wouldn't mind, Travis, to get into your kind of, because I want to create a story of where you come from, um, especially here in New Mexico and some of the things that you've done. And then we'll get right into the subject with business and disability. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thank you so much, Jason, for having me on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah. So I was born and raised here in Albuquerque. Um, I was born with a physical disability, uh, cerebral palsy. And um, for anyone that may not know what cerebral palsy is, um, it's a birth defect and it's a neurological disability. The When I was born, I had a lack of oxygen in my brain. And so that caused some damage and uh, the nerves in my legs weren't firing at the same time with the nerves in my brain. So um, if anyone sees me just as I go out in public, um, they'll notice that I have a little bit trouble walking. Uh, I use forearm crutches uh, or I use a wheelchair for, you know, longer distances. Um, As I grew up um, into my er early, uh, early teens, I got involved with the uh, Carrie Tingley Hospital Foundation here. And I was uh, a part of the um, wheelchair basketball team under the um, coach of uh, Judge um, Pat Murdoch. And, you know, that was, that was a really awesome experience for me. It um, really opened up my eyes to other disabilities out there like uh, spina bifida. And, you know, we had the opportunity to go on tournaments outside of New Mexico and, and compete. And, you know, we were ranked as high as, uh, if my memory serves me correct, uh, ninth in the nation. You oh, know, that's awesome. Accepted yeah, they only accepted the top sixteen teams around this around the states. And so we were able to um, qualify for nationals every year that I was on the team. And yeah, the last year that I was on it, we um, we were ranked as uh, high as ninth. Mm, that's awesome. And so you were able to be a part of that. And then you turn around and um so how did how did the TED talk come about? How were you able to speak in that? Sure. So um, I, I got my master's here um, at UNM in adapted physical education. And the first semester that I was in, uh, I was taking a sports sociology course. And uh, one of the presentations that I gave was on uh, social inclusion in sports. Mm. And I bas- basically talked about the importance of having um, interactions with people with disabilities and without and the, the impact that can have on the wider community. And so as I was kind of working through it, I saw that there was an opening um, or a call for speakers at the local TEDx um, organization here. And so I had submitted my my topic on social inclusion and education. And uh, because previously before that, I was a substitute teacher for three years at Boston School. And so um, I, I just kind of was like a shot in the dark kind of thing. I actually didn't think I was going to get um, an email back. Um, but, you know, sure enough, about a month later, I was in my um, legal rights for persons with disability class. And in the middle of it, I got the email and I just couldn't think of anything else after I got that email. <laughs> I can imagine. Was like an hour of class left. And I was just like, I'm kind of checked out for the for the day. Right, right. Yeah, that is awesome. And then so, uh, Travis, I, I've always, you know, one of the things that, because you say you like to look at problems, you know, especially sure. when it comes to disabilities. One of the things that I see all the time is people's perception of, of you know, somebody that has a disability. What are you, some of the things like that you see, you know, like, especially like maybe with where someone psychologically is looking at someone and then there's always that, you know, like, I mean, I know you've experienced it. You know, whether, you know, whether it's and I've read articles where people, you know, have said it's like, you know, racism and stuff like that, where people are kind of, you know, there's this 
feeling that people get and and is it uncomfortable or how should we you know you know what i mean there's there's always this like rub i guess and i i've i've wanted to always be able to address this because i feel like people especially you know here in the united states it, it's and we're going to get into it with business and hiring people with disabilities what do you see on the psychological front with that yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, I think when I was growing up, um, you know, I, I I was using forearm crutches, and then I um, started to use a wheelchair, and that's kind of what my what I use right now is either either one of them, and and so I would notice when I would go out into public places, people would. Um, stare at me like little kids you know right. they would stare at me just because you know they hadn't seen anyone like me and there's such a, a small um, minority of uh, individuals with disabilities here in New Mexico and then you know break it down even more in Albuquerque you know there's not a lot of us here right so um, so that can be a, a little bit challenging just from a psychological um, aspect of it Um I think for for adults there is this psychological side um, in 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 terms of hiring and, and like the business it's a part of it, but I think overall um, that's just at least for me that's just something that I've just had to block out of my head of not feeling like there's all this attention on me or right. just kind of feeling like, uh, you know, someone's still staring at me. You know, I just have to be a little bit um, more empathetic to for that other person and just kind of see it from their point of view, which I think being in the classroom has really helped me um, be more sensitive to the needs of little kids or um, younger students. Right. Yeah, no, th that makes sense. So w whenever we look at somebody, especially in, um, you know, especially maybe they're a business owner or something like that, and, and they're looking at hiring. And I know you had talked about that, you know, we were talking about a little bit off air, but what does that look like? I mean, like, what do you see with like people skimming over it? Or, you, you know, like, is there some form of you know, like, well, I wouldn't hire this person or, you know, well, I need to talk to this person first. How does that, how does that, what have you seen play out? Yeah, you know, I, I had the opportunity to um, intern at the Office of Equal Opportunity at UNM a couple years ago. And, you know, I had a conversation with the director just about the same thing, about whether or not it's uh, important to disclose your, your disability on the application. You know, there are some organizations and some federal places that actually go out of their way to hire people with disabilities. Right. But, you know, when, when you... Um, put or disclose it on an online application, there's always that chance that that person may not, on the other end, the hiring manager may not understand or know what that disability is or just kind of brush it off and think like, well, we can't hire that person because we don't have, um, we can't make the uh, accommodations to, to do that. And obviously they wouldn't go back and tell you that. They right. would just say like, we just weren't qualified or we chose somebody else. But um I think that is something that, you know, businesses should, you know, keep in mind that there are people out there with disabilities who are qualified to, to do these things and, and, you know, have degrees in the education and um, are able to do more than what the, possibly the hiring manager might think that they can't do. Yeah. And, and I've seen, I've seen it. Uh, I, I don't know how many times I've seen it when I've talked to business owners, it's like, you know, they'll have a, especially like, and, and, and maybe you can speak to this, they'll have like an older building, you know, like yes. they'll have stairs that are, you know, not, um, I mean, I mean, there's laws against this now, but like bathrooms and stuff like that and stairways into there. How can, how can a business owner be mindful of this? What would you say that they should do? Cause I know you said you've put yourself reverse in there you know, in their shoes to kind of look at and, and display empathy. Mm -hmm. How would a business owner do that? Well, um, r right off the top of my head, I, I would think that they should, you know, get feedback and go out of the way to make connections with uh, individuals who have physical disabilities. 
um, I think that's really important to have kind of like allies in right. in, in that way. Um, you know, it can be it can be tough to um, really know what to do if you don't have that um, perspective or that other person is coming alongside you to like tell you what you're doing wrong, you know, what you're doing right. Uh, and then, you know, be in touch with the hiring manager. If there's not a hiring manager, then learning as much as you can about the ADA and, you know, what was done back in 1990 to make it possible for individuals with disabilities to not be discriminated anymore. Right. And to allow buildings to um, be accessible for for individuals that are using a wheelchair or that have other um, different types of mobilities issues. Yeah, and I think you know some one of the things that I've seen, um, especially when it comes to, it's kind of like a, an attitude of, well, we have to do this or we have to do that or the law tells us this. Instead of having this, you know, you you want to have your business be all inclusive for everyone. So whatever that takes in the sense of making sure that that everyone is comfortable when they're visiting your business, I think that's to me. That's where you're when you have that um, energy of inv- of people being feeling like they can be invited, and you ha- you know like it's on websites. You know you don't see that very much on websites. You know making sure that you make that very clear when someone looks at. You know I know Google My Business now has started to put you know you know you can put information if you're you know if if it's handicap accessible and all that. But how, how many times do businesses do we forget that? Yeah, you you bring up a good point, and I'd like to add on to that is that some of the websites uh, that businesses have are actually may not even be um, accessible for the user. So right. you know the the website itself may not be able to um, whether it's like not a lar- not um, large enough text or just some of the things that um, online accessibility. Um, is requiring you to do to make sure that not only is your physical building up to code, but also your website um, has enough information and is optimized for um, anybody, whether they have um, a disability or not. You know, a lot of times uh, individuals who are hard of hearing or um, are um, are blind um, may run into trouble if the website is not optimized for their um, to to what they need. Yeah, and I, and I always encourage business owners. One of the simplest things that you can do, and it'll always help your website, is to make sure that you have chat enabled on the website. Um, and you know that has a lot to do with it. As for there's programs that can handle that. You know whether whatever disability is, usually they can text or it'll read back to them and then they can text back to them back and forth. I know Google has the ability for free to be able to have that on your website. So it's something that can help, um, you know, and then allow people to be able to, because I I would imagine like you were talking, um, do you know the percentage of, of how many people are disabled in Albuquerque or you said it's really low? You know, um, you know, that's one thing that when I was working with the Carrie Tingley Hospital Foundation, you know, we were trying to find data. Right. And, you know, for whatever reason, the state just hasn't um, been able to get their data up to, you know, at that time we were looking, it was like 2016. But a lot of the, the data that the state has is either very old or they haven't tracked enough um, people to um, to get the numbers. And, you know, I'm not ragging on the state or, or anything like that. I just, th- I just think that it's, it's, it could be possible. One of the factors could be is that there's not a lot of, of individuals with physical disabilities. You know, I think the, the population of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities is more prevalent here. Um, and, you know, there's more services for, for those individuals. But when it comes to physical disabilities, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's harder for us to find services and, you know, it's, it's harder for us to um, be identified and how how because I know you've been in the educational system like UNM and then you know schools local schools here in the area how how are they with it? 
Um, I think they're getting better. You know, when I was with the um, Office of Equal Opportunity, um, I, I kind of got to see the the nuts and bolts and, and got to see where the university is going um, in terms of tracking the data. Right. And, um, you know, I have really good friends at the um, Accessibility Resource Center at UNM, and I know that they work in conjunction with the OEO sometimes. And, you know, they do a really good job of making sure that um, – uh, that they track the data and that they um, help any, any individual with disabilities feel comfortable and setting them up for success. That's awesome. One, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you um, when we were coming on, when I knew that you were coming on, is I, I have a lot of people that, uh, that I know that may have a, a family member, um, you know, a be disabled or something like that. And there's always like uh, language and things that they they don't know what to do, what to do, you know, there's always that. And I I want to make sure that people understand, especially from your perspective, like some of the, if you don't mind, some of the do's and the don'ts, and we don't have to get super specific, but there's always this, like I said earlier, there's always this rub. And then, you know, especially if it may be, maybe they have a child, you know, that was born or, you know, whatever it may be, uh, maybe an elderly mother or something like that. What are some of the things that you see with that? Um, you know, I, I see that, you know, language is um, a really important when right. you are discussing or talking about someone with a disability. You know, when I was in grad school, we, we talked about the um, person first language instead of saying um, he's disabled, you know, he has a disability. Um, instead of saying like he's autistic, he has uh, so he has, is someone with autism. Um, so, you know, the, there are different differing opinions on whether it's important to use that language or not. Right. Um, you know, and actually those opinions, most of them come from the disabled community because uh, I've known individuals who don't like to use that type of language. Right. But I think for individuals who don't have a disability, um, just to make sure that they are being um, conscientious of that person, you know, always identifying the person first, then talking about their disability, you know, and I think that that type of education is also um, taught as in the special education programs, which is great. And, um, you know, you know, like you said, there's there's tons of verbiage and there's tons of information in regards to do's and don'ts. And I've, I've gotten that question a lot myself from students and other, other right. adults. But I, I just kind of go back to the first thing is, you know, let's make sure we identify the person first, then their disability and not um, vice versa. Yeah, I had a good friend of mine from the Marine Corps and um, he was involved in an accident in war. And um, we always talk back and forth and he's like, I just hate when they use words like special needs or handicap or, you know, like the worst, like crippled or something like that. And, yeah. you know, he, he was like, there, there's, there's this whole, you know, victim mentality. And he was over and over again, you know, I'm not a victim and I don't want to be treated a certain fake way. You, you know what I mean? And I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, it does. You know, there was a um, a documentary that came out a couple months ago on uh, Netflix called Crip Camp, mm. and you know, I watched it, and you know, it it um, highlighted um, this period of time at a at a summer camp for individuals with disabilities, and 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 how um, the disability revolution and and everything kind of came about. Um, but even in the, um, in, you know, the title Crip Camp, I mean, I don't personally use the word cripple when describing myself, but, you know, I have friends that, that use it and right. who are disabled and that use it. And, you know, they, they kind of say it as like a badge of honor, but, you know, I guess I'm still a little old school and thinking that that word has some derogatory connotation right. to it. Of course. So right. I've really just kind of stayed a, away from, of, of using it. Yeah. And, and like some of the things like, cause I, I had talked to him about this. Some of the things like he didn't like is, you know, like somebody, you know, pushing themselves on you and then trying to help, you know, and like overly help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I noticed that, um, in, in like high school where I would have friends who, you know, would want to push me and, and, you know, 
kind of maybe be overly helpful, like you had said, but um, I've always kind of stayed away from <laughs> right, getting, right, right. that extra help. Um, I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten more, um, I, my, you know, my views on that's kind of changed, right? You know, as, as you know, I'm, I'm 32 now. Right. And so, you know, my body isn't what it used to be when I was in high school. So, you know, there are times where maybe extra help is needed for me. And, you know, that's not a bad thing. Um, but then you still have individuals with disabilities who are like, regardless of how old I am, I'm not ever going to have an able-bodied person help me or push me or, or whatever. And, you know, that's their prerogative. And, you know, I'm not here to say that one is better than the other. That's just, you know, how I live my life and that's how they live theirs. No, I love that. And, you know, also is like people talking about you in front of you. You know, I, I um, when I had talked to my friend, he said that too. He's like, I'm right here. Why are you, you know, it's like I'm feeling less than right now, you know, because these are some of the things that I think some people, I mean, there's rude people, of course, throughout the world. We all get that. But it's this, you know, oh, I met this person. They're disabled. How can I, you know, communicate with them? How can I talk to them? How am I? I think most people would will try to be respectful. Do you get that? Yeah, I do. You know, I have this unique experience where um, I'm able to walk with crutches, as I mentioned before, but I also use a wheelchair for long distances. Right. So I, I've kind of I've had it um, both ways. And it's just really interesting when folks think that I'm paralyzed because I'm in the wheelchair mm. and to kind of get that experience. But then when I stand up, they you know would freak out or they would <laughs> right, right. have a bunch of more questions, right? Because right. they view like disabled as wheelchair and, you know, if you're standing, then you're not disabled. So when they see someone standing up, they're like, well, why do you need it? So there's like this other layer of like talking and educating that, you know, you have to kind of um, um, unravel for them and say like, well, you know, there are assistive de assisted devices that allows a person to, who needs extra help to, to move along. So, you know, in this case, the wheelchair acts as that, just like my crutches act like that. And, um, you know, you have walkers and canes and and all sorts of other um, assistive devices for individuals who um, may, may be nonverbal or have a hard time communicating with their mouth. So right. there's other incredible ways to do it with a computer, iPad. Um, there's just a lot of great things out there. Right. And and what are some of the things, because I know they use the word able-bodied and all that as far as, what are some of the things that you wish people knew about being disabled? Have, have you know, I don't know if you've ever articulated this or thought about it, but what, what do you know some of the things that you wish that they would know? Yeah, I, I think I, w I would wish that they would know more about adapted sports, really, because, right. you know, I think that's the easiest way to bridge someone who isn't disabled to understand what being in, in a what being disabled is is like, you know, because you know you have the Paralympics, and you know there's there's eyeballs on it obviously, right. but not enough. So when I was on the wheelchair basketball team, and then having the opportunity to, to coach the wheelchair basketball team 15 years later, um, I was able to get other high schools involved with um, our practices. And it was really helpful for them, the the students, the volunteers, to work with the, my players. And to be able to have that inclusion aspect, I think, really brought um, that understanding. And it's, uh, you know, it, it took away that sort of um, wall that right. I think a lot of times people with disabilities feel like there is between an able-bodied person and them. So when, when you get uh, individuals who don't have a disability together playing a sport mm. um, like wheelchair basketball, which I think is like the easiest um, adaptive sport to pick up for someone who, who doesn't have a disability, right? Um, you know, then you can start to break down those barriers. Yeah, no, I know. I think that would be beautiful to be to see children playing. I, I mean, together like that, uh, there, there's going to be so much learning that goes on. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, the, we went to and did it at Manzano High School. We did it at La Cueva. We've done it at Albuquerque Academy. Oh, this past time was like six times. You know, we've we've been able to go to different schools and, you know, my time with the Carrie Tinley Hospital Foundations really helped broaden those um, experiences for for um, kids and students who don't have disabilities. And, right. Um, I've just been really fortunate to have the opportunity to do speaking engagements and, um, you know, facilitate those discussions. Yeah. And if somebody wanted to um, learn more about this, if somebody wanted to be able to speak with you or have you um, speak to a group, what is the best way? Because I know we're getting on, um, it's almost, a, this will be, you know, this is pre recorded and we'll put it out there a little bit later, but we're getting close to five o'clock and I want to let you go. What are some of the best ways that people could get a hold of you? Yeah, they can get all of me. They can email me at you know, Travis at TravisDavis.net. Um, you know, then go to my website, TravisDavis.net. Um, you know, they can reach uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I have a pretty good um, online presence there or your face or Facebook. Right. Um, you know, I try to be as visible as, as possible, you know, especially during this time with um, the coronavirus. You know, I, I really think that this is going to um, benefit individuals with disabilities, you know, um, with businesses. And um, I think more people are going to embrace this remote work yes. learning and really look at like, okay, well, yeah, well, we actually can employ this person with a disability if they want to work from home or, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's a cost effective way of not having them in the office, you know, not talking like segregation, but just, you know, not needing them to be in the office physically, but still be able to do their job. Right. No, I love that. And what are some of the things like if somebody's thinking about bringing you in into their organization to speak, what are the, some of the things that you speak about? Sure. I speak about um, disability awareness in organizations. Um, you know, I've done uh, numerous um, talks at schools. I've been at um, Manzano, Manzano Day School, uh, Sandia Prep, Bosque Academy, you know, uh, a lot of the private schools. Uh, I had an opportunity to speak at a private school in Phoenix last year, and they were going to bring me back this year, but couldn't do it because of the COVID. Right. But, you know, um, even even like adapted sports, um, you know, a lot of times organizations or places may want to find ways to um, bring that awareness in some fun and creative way. So, you know, having wheelchairs available and, and coming up with this, you know, small, short game can, you know, really... Um, it can really help even adults who may not know as much as I would like them to, or the right. disabled community would like them to. So is it, is it kind of like you with, with like, let's say the YMCA or a, a local gym on a basketball court, it's bringing wheelchairs in there and then allowing people to kind of experience that. Yeah. You know, just like an exhibition game. And, you know, we, uh, you know, when I was coaching the basketball team, uh, the Carrie Tingley, we would go to the the schools and their wheelchair ba the, our my wheelchair basketball team would play their boys and girls basketball team in wheelchairs and mm. you know we would get um, the community involved and they would come and it would be a fundraiser but then I think it's just on a macro level it was uh, just a really great uh, educational experience and you know you can duplicate that in any organization it doesn't have to be in a school setting I think right. there's a lot of um, ways you can uh, team build at other organizations. And I think sometimes the team building can um, gets a bad rap for just kind of being monotonous or just not having enough um, spice to it. So I think this could actually um, be something that could, uh, that could help. That's awesome, Travis. Well, I thank you. I want to be respectful of your time. I thank you for coming on. I appreciate you um, sharing. Um, I, I asked some kind of pointed questions, so I appreciate you answering those. I hope it helps um, businesses, business owners, the leadership that's out there in Albuquerque. I think this is important. If they want to get a hold of you again, what's your website again? Yeah, it's uh, travisdavis.net or uh, my email address is travis at travisdavis.net. Perfect. Well, thank you, Travis. I appreciate you being on today. 
Hey, thank you so much, Jason. And thanks you. Thank you for all the things that you do in this community. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us on the Albuquerque business podcast. Thanks to our sponsor, RigbyDigital.com. Make sure to subscribe and share and go to ABQPodcast.com. Get show notes, resources, and links to everything we talked about today to help you navigate your journey as an entrepreneur and business owner.